started. All right, hey everyone. Uh, thank you so much again for joining this talk. My name is Mohit. I'm a developer advocate here at Salesforce. Uh, and, uh, you know, DevOps is one of my uh, passionate areas. I'm really passionate about DevOps in general and specifically passionate about DevOps on our Salesforce platform. Now, during the talk, if you have any questions, feel free to use the question panel there. And also after the talk, if you have any other questions or concerns, please reach out to me on my Twitter and also on my email ID. Now, before I begin, there is a forward-looking statement here because I'm a Salesforce employee and Salesforce is a publicly traded company. Please do not make any purchasing decisions on anything forward-looking that I might make in this presentation. Okay, with that, let's get started. So we'll first start with what is DevOps before we look into some of the adoption challenges for Salesforce platform and how to mitigate them. So the goal of DevOps is to release with confidence. So what does DevOps do? So DevOps automates your software development with your IT operations so that you can release your software quicker with a, a higher quality. So uh, if, you look, if you look at this, uh, I have uh, sort of listed what are IT operations. So IT operations typically involve release management, disaster management, infrastructure management, configurations, now, if you look at, you know, I have, I have striked this manage infrastructure because that's where Salesforce is really different. You don't have infrastructure to manage, but we definitely do have uh, a release management. We need a release management for Salesforce apps. We need disaster management. We need configuration management. So in short, the goal of DevOps, as I said, is short development life cycle, continuous delivery. That means you're releasing your applications faster uh, without sort of breaking uh, your existing app and with higher software quality. So everything in this goal section that I've listed here is so relevant today, considering the world we are. So we are in this digital transformation, we are in this pandemic world, and you know, software is one of the ways we interact today. And releasing software at a higher uh, you know, at a higher speed is the need of an hour today. And that's why DevOps becomes so important. All right, so let's look at how is Salesforce DevOps different than DevOps on any other platform. So if you look at uh, DevOps generally on any other platform, it's all managed through code. Usually you have like, uh, you know, a, a source code and then you have a file like the YAML file where you sort of add more code and manage your DevOps. Uh, how is Salesforce DevOps different? Salesforce DevOps is really different because you have, we have admins and a local developers like business consultants building applications with what we call it as low code builder tools like app builder, flow, schema builder, and many more. So it's just drag and drop or clicks and points to build applications. And that's the power of our applications. And that's the differentiator for Salesforce is we allow low code developers who are familiar with the business and know a little bit of code to use these tools and build applications. At the same time, we also have pro code developers. So pro code developers are using, uh, you know, Apex, Lightning Web Components, or they're building services on Heroku, uh, or they're using one of our APIs. So that's the pro code. Now, all of these, uh, you know, personas like admins, developers, business consultants, and architects, they, they work together to build a Salesforce application. So that's why our Salesforce DevOps is different. We cannot just use, uh, you know, uh, the, the, we cannot just adopt the trend as it is from uh, other software, uh, you know, DevOps best practices. We have to nurture, we have to change it. We have to optimize it so that every persona becomes a part of it. So let's look at some of the, uh, you know, adoption challenges that we have. So my first challenge uh, that I see in all of the projects is Salesforce low code developers are not used to pro code tools for version control, specifically like Git. This is our definitely first uh, and the most, uh, you know, uh, most problematic areas. Low code developers are not familiar with the version control and Git because uh, you know they are they need you know they need to upskill on this. 
So what are some of the challenges, right? So challenges are very few administrators and business consultants understand this pro code tool like Git and, uh, you know, and using Git involves pro code uh, tools. Like you need to understand CLI, you need to understand IDE. Uh, also, there is lack of understanding of Salesforce metadata. Now, if you're building applications on Salesforce at the end of the day, it's a metadata, it's an XML packet. Uh, so a lot of local developers do not want to edit those XML packets or don't understand them. So that's our first challenge. So how do we mitigate it? So one of the easiest way to mitigate that is obviously use tools that your admins can be easily trained and feel comfortable with. Example, I like Flowsome very much in that regard, because what Flowsome does is it has a very simplified UI that uh, your administrators or local developers will feel that they uh, they are very used to because it's very much similar like Salesforce and it's built on Salesforce platform. Um, so that's that's one of the mitigation strategy. The other strategy could be you comprehensively train your administrators on version control and Salesforce metadata. That's uh, uh, that's one of the ways to mitigate it. The other option is you also use sandbox source tracking. So sandbox source tracking was a feature we launched. The whole idea behind this feature is it allows developers to easily help the local developers to version their changes. So when you are collaboratively working, the version control um, responsibility is shared. You know, it's it's more on developers, and developers can definitely help you version version the code and the 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 low code that your administrators have built. Also, let's look at the second challenge. So it takes experience to master Salesforce metadata concept and the concept of metadata dependency. Now, this is one of the frequent things that I see that a lot of our even pro code developers lack an understanding of metadata and its dependency and how everything ties up. So let's look at some of the challenges with metadata types. So at Salesforce, we have 450 plus metadata types and settings. You can go to metadata coverage report to learn more about them. Also, you will see that, you know, when you are sort of deploying metadata from one arc to another, most of the failures are because the developers have failed to understand or administrators or low code builders have failed to understand there is this thing called metadata dependency. So what is metadata dependency? So it's a dependency chain or a hierarchical chain that gets established. It's a graph, you can call it as a graph that happens between different metadata. So let's say for example, you create a custom object, you create some fields, and now you use these fields in page layouts or in your profiles or in your pro code like Apex or LWC. So you're creating a chain of interdependency between these metadata types, which is less understood by developers. And usually, uh, what I see is when you are using chain sets, you forget to add one of those dependencies. Like let's say you are trying to move an LWC component, which has a reference to a field and you forgot to add that field in your uh, deployment package. So your deployment actually fails. So that's uh, the, the challenge. And note that in Salesforce, not all metadata types can be versioned as of today. Although there's a lot of work that's happening to, to fix this under the hood. So these are some of our challenges. Uh, so how do we mitigate them? So more education around metadata API. That is, uh, you know, as, as you are thought to work with objects and fields and, uh, you know, other low code declarative tools, we should also educate our administrators and low code developers on what, go, what is formed behind the scenes, the XML packet and show them how those XML packets sort of corresponds to the work that they have declaratively done through the UI, through the Salesforce setup UI. And also other challenges that, that I see is we fail to tie the work item to metadata types. So what does it mean? So this means when you are uh, sort of creating your user story, generally not a lot of Salesforce uh, organizations or Salesforce development workshop realize that there needs to be a history of what is the user story that you have solved and what are the components that you have created. Today, there's no relation between that. And although we have products like DevOps Center, which is gonna help in this regard, 
and also Flowsum has this excellent capability today where you can relate, uh, you know, or you can integrate with, uh, you know, your uh, planner tools like Jira uh, and uh, other, uh, you know, Confluence and other tools like that. So you need to uh, tighten this up. Like you need to track that for this work item, these are the metadata types that we have created. Also adopt CI CD. Now this is the, the other challenge is I talked about how metadata dependency can, uh, you know, can impact your uh, speed with which you deploy app applications. So that's why we have CI CD. So what CI CD does is it's an automated system that makes sure that you're not missing any dependency. So with version control and CI CD, you make sure that your dependency is intact when you are building the new features for your application. And then understand which metadata types can be versioned and which are org dependent. This is a very important thing to understand. In fact, you should have a documentation that lists what are the you know, metadata types in your organization that you cannot version and it, which exist directly in the production org. Now, some examples of you know, metadata types that cannot be versioned is in this slide. That is, you have named credential auth providers, connected apps, email templates, reports, and dashboards. So some of these are you know, can be directly built in production and some of these cannot be versioned because they have sensitive information. Like for example, auth providers, they have keys. You shouldn't version them. You should directly keep them in production. If you are like sort of using them, then restrict it to, uh, you know, do not put them on your Git repo because that's gonna expose your secret information. Okay, so what is the third challenge? So the third challenge is no dedicated release manager. Now, oftentimes what I've seen is uh, as a team, people uh, do not understand the importance of a release manager. Our developers are given the role of release manager. So what does this do? This puts lots of stress as a role for release manager. So a release manager has a lot more responsibilities. Like he needs to communicate with dev leads, test engineers, and product managers. But, you know, you staff your developers to act as release managers. So they are not able to do either their development job properly or the release management job properly. So definitely, if you have an application which is really large, you should have a dedicated release manager. Now, you can definitely mitigate this for smaller projects with Flowsum uh, and other tools. So mitigation strategy, again, uh, for larger projects, definitely have a dedicated release manager. Um, and the release manager will build your release calendar. There's a lot of interdependencies that needs to be managed between different teams. And you need to maintain a list of changes between the environments. And this is very important for the governance. I'll talk a bit about governance here. But a release manager can do all of these activities. So, uh, you know, you, you're really sure that what is going into your org for a specific release. And also a release manager should have a knowledge of Salesforce metadata types and Salesforce deployment lifecycle. So have someone as a release manager who, uh, you know, who knows a little bit of application development on Salesforce platform, but they are more interested in uh, sort of helping and migrating changes. Let's look at the, the next challenge, which is organizations fail to understand DevOps culture. Now this is very, very important. You might have tools, you might have CI CD, you might have version control. Still, you might fail adopting, uh, you know, adopting the DevOps uh, and, you know, your DevOps strategy might, might be a failure. And the reason for that is because you fail to understand, uh, you know, the DevOps culture. Now, what is DevOps culture? So in a DevOps, right, connect your teams. That is developers, release managers, testers, they, they should all feel part of the same team. Get, get people to know each other, establish a good communication channel, celebrate each other's accomplishments and foster a knowledge sharing and no blame culture. Now, this is very, very important. Uh, you know, I, I cannot stress the importance of it. Most of the highly performing teams have these characteristics. That is, they have a good team bonding between uh, every member of the team. So it is very important that if you are, uh, you know, if you want to be successful with your DevOps strategy, uh, it's not just about technology and tools. It's also about people. That is, you have to connect uh, and build this culture among your team. Let's look at the last, but the most important challenge, which is lack of governance. 
So what is governance and you know, why you should have governance. So a governance, if you do not have governance in place, that is, if you do not have vision and strategy, governance is all about tracking, uh, vision strategy and alignment. So if you do not have governance, right, you will see that as you know, you will have lots of enhancement requests, lots of bugs, and you're just catching up every time there's, and this happens because you do not have a vision and a strategy. You do not have a backlog and you have failed to define your software life cycle. So what are some of the things that you should have, uh, you know, when, when you say, okay, my organization is mature and have a good governance, you should have a data strategy. You should have an architectural management. What does it mean? Like architectural management? Let's imagine, let's take an example, data model in Salesforce. It's very easy to build the data models in Salesforce. Anybody can go and click and point and build. But what happens if teams are working parallelly? They will replicate the same data model that's already built there in Salesforce. Or, you know, teams, if teams are not collaborating, you will see there will be duplicate fields, there will be duplicate objects. So that's why you need to have an architecture and management because uh, with, with proper, let's say, an architectural review board, uh, for your application, any data model change that you're making will go through a committee. So they can make sure that, okay, they, you know, you're building a sound data model, which is not replicative because with replicative data models, you will, uh, you know, you will end up having duplicate data in your system. And then that becomes a challenge to clean it up. And then finally, the communication strategy, what does it mean? So communication strategy means you have proper channels establish a healthy communication and uh, you know you have meetings um, scheduled for uh, important tasks like your scrum meetings you know obviously that this whole devops thing actually also uh, aligns pretty much well with agile development uh, patterns and standards so you should have scrum meeting you should have architectural review meetings all right, so how do I know if I have a healthy DevOps for my Salesforce apps? The first thing is you should properly plan a Salesforce project. It's, it's easier to put it on the slide, but this slide is really hard to implement from my experience. So what do we need here? So we need a definition of done. Whenever um, you, know, you write a story, make sure that you have a definition of ready and definition of done. That means, uh, you know, what your story should be properly, you know, articulated. You should say, okay, at the end of the story, once I'm done, what should be, uh, how does it look like? Or what should be the acceptance criteria? You should have burned down charts to make sure that, okay, how did your last sprint go? How did your current sprint is going? So you can compare, you should have a backlog. Again, as I said, you should have product backlog and a sprint backlog. Now this might merge or collide if your project is smaller. But if for a larger products, right, you should have sprint and product backlogs, and then you should have the governance defined. So you should have well-defined roles and responsibilities. So this is also one of the challenges that I see, uh, you know, during the, the DevOps adoption is like, there's no defined roles, you know, use something like RACI metrics. That is who is responsible, who is, uh, you know, accountable, who should be informed and who should be consulted, right? So, so put together a chart of RACI with these different roles. That way you will know that, okay, who is accountable and who owns what? And also enforce best practice documentation, right? So documentation is often ignored, but when you are having a mature, when, if you need to have a matured Salesforce DevOps practice, you should have all of these, like you should have your data architecture defined. You should have a, a documentation for your security architecture. What should be your uh, deployment and development standards and the best practices? Like what should be your code review standards? You should have all of these assets and documents. What should be your testing strategy? What part of the application are you, uh, you know, unit testing it? What are you integration testing it? And then how do you manage regressions? And also, uh, you know, how do you automate all of these uh, testings? So you should have, there are different tools for that. Um, so you should take into consideration and you should also integrate these testing strategy with your CI CD. So Flowsum allows you to do that actually, or if you have any other CI CD system, you should actually integrate. And then you should also look into performance best practices. Every 
architecture that you do, you should assess for the, the performance and explore the boundaries of the performance. All right, with that, I'll, I'll pause and then you know, we'll take some questions here. Um, All right, awesome. That was really well presented, thank you. So we do have a couple questions. Um, I am going to jump right into them. The first one is, I have an org with various Salesforce apps. How long does it take to implement a DevOps solution? Oh, that's a very good question. So typically it takes um, at least one to two months. Now with Flosum, I think it takes 30 minutes, uh, sorry, it takes 30 uh, days at least. Uh, but one thing, one key thing to understand in implementing a DevOps solution is it's just not about putting together the tools. Like you can put together these tools in probably a week or two if you have experienced uh, DevOps engineers. But the you know, but you have to get and work and collaborate with other members of the team because it's it's like you put the process, but then you also want this process to be adopted. So that takes a bit of time, and that's why I say like it takes a month or a, or a couple a couple of months to get used to it. And training plays a very important role here, and you should start with something. Um, you know, you should aim uh, in the stages of like, let's say first I want to crawl and then I want to walk and then I want to run. So that strategy has worked pretty well for me in the past. Awesome. All right. Next question is, you talked about the sandbox source tracking feature. Could you expand how it would be helpful to devs and admins? Definitely. So sandbox source tracking is one of the features that got to launch in the last release. Now that summer 21 is out, it's spring 21 is when we launched this feature. So what this feature allows you to do is previously, it was very hard to find out what metadata items got changed when you, are, when you were sort of configuring uh, solutions on Salesforce or when you are building your code. Now we provide uh, this sandbox source tracking. So Salesforce automatically tracks all the metadata changes that is happening when you are working in a sandbox. So, and also we detect that, uh, you know, there is a difference between uh, like, for example, let's say that there is a developer and an admin working on a solution. And previously it was very hard to find out what changes did the admin made, what changes developer made, it was all manual. Now we provide one single command, which developers can run and find out, okay, these are the files that were changed by uh, X and Y developers. So, so it makes it very easy to work uh, or it makes it very easier for devs and admins to collaborate and devs can take that responsibility of uh, helping admins to version their changes. Awesome. Okay. So next we have, um, how do you manage parallel development in different dev development sandboxes? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. So for parallel development in different sandboxes, right? So that is where you need version control and the CI CD or a tool like Flosum, which has all of these integrated. So what happens is when you're doing a parallel development, right? We want to make sure that any changes that you are doing is committed to a branch, which is an integration branch, uh, you know, which is a branch in your version control. So anything that you are changing goes to the version control. So there is this centralized integration branch where we see, okay, commits that are happening from multiple developers and then we can pick and choose okay which ones uh, you know should be changed um, so ci cd i would say like in short implement a version control system uh, you know using uh, something like git or flowsome which has its native version control and then have a ci cd server running like jenkins or uh, circle ci there are many and flowsome also has a, a support for many of these and integrates with many of these tools awesome um, so I am going to ask a couple more, sure. uh, you know, someone's wondering if you can just address tools for determining metadata depends dependencies, if you have any knowledge on that. Yes, definitely. So metadata dependency. Yes. So we have a tool, um, or we have an API, let's say an API that's going to help. So it's called metadata dependency API. You can find the documentation in the tooling API. It's in the beta and there's still a lot of work that's going on there, but that helps to some extent. The other way to manage or find out the metadata dependencies use open source tools. So we have various app exchange products on app exchange. You can find them. 
Uh, also, I did a session on this topic in Apex Hours, which is an open source um, community. So you can find that on the YouTube if you just search for Apex Hours YouTube channel and you will see a session on that. Uh, and also tools like Flowsome has built in way to help you to figure out those metadata dependency. All right, awesome. Um, we actually do have quite a few more questions, but I think we're gonna move on. I'll just do one more. Okay. Um, let's see, how about, what are some of the benefits of Salesforce unlocked packages for customers? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So Salesforce unlocked packages. So packaging technology was uh, initially for ISV or application uh, you know, vendors on App Exchange who were distributing it. The whole idea behind the, the managed package at that time was it provides upgradability um, and also it makes it deployment pretty smooth. Uh, and with package, you have a really good boundary around your metadata. So unlock packages is a feature that we launched so that uh, the, we, we can take the goodness from that managed package application build and provide the same uh, features and functionalities to our customers, like the enterprise customers, without they having to build managed packages because managed packages are again meant only for ISV vendors. So with unlock packages, what you can do is today your org is a monolith. That means you know it has all the metadata in it. There's no separation. Uh, so anytime you want to iterate upon uh, the, you know, or build new feature, uh, there is, you know, there's a lot of challenge because, you know, you have to then um, make sure that your code is not sort of um, basically conflicting with any of the metadata dependency. So with unlock packages, what you can do is you can break that monolith metadata into multiple smaller packages. So with multiple smaller packages, which are independent which are independent and then have a dependency explicitly configured, the, the main advantage is you get agility. That is, you know, now everything is micro, it's, it's like microservice, right? You're no more building a monolith, it's a microservice. So it's very easy to say, okay, I now want to, uh, you know, I can easily break my application into multiple packages. And we have a sample app called Easy Spaces, which is on our GitHub repository. So search for easy spaces where we show you uh, how to break your package into uh, into this, how to break your monolith package into multiple um, unlock packages. Now, I want to say that, you know, just because we allow you to break your monolith into multiple packages, do not overcomplicate and do not overly create packages. Like don't create like 50 packages, which becomes really very hard to manage and orchestrate. So there needs to be a fine balance in architecture around uh, defining this. 